I am Maria Cristina Marinescu from the Smart Cities Group in CASE at BSC. Um, I will spend the next 15, well, hopefully 15, most likely 20 minutes, introducing a little bit uh, the type of work that we're doing in our, in our uh, group um, uh, in terms of multidisciplinary research um, on top of uh, using a lot of different sources of, of big data, okay? And then um, I will give the floor to my colleagues, first Artem Reshednikov and then uh, uh, Joaquim Moret, and they will talk about um, detailed, well, techniques um, that we are developing and applying in one of the projects in, in our group, which has to do with cultural heritage, in particular with paintings. So let me just start here. Um, the, basically, the, the, the high-level goal, the basic high-level goal uh, for the work that we're doing is to generate quality results, both for querying and for uh, different type of analyses, uh, big data analysis, um, over different types of data. And you will see some examples. Um, in order to be able to do this um, effectively, it is fundamental to integrate data from many heterogeneous data sources. What do you uh, gain by doing that? Hopefully with uh, the example that you'll see, um, either the ones at very high level that I will talk about and more in the rest of the talk where my colleagues will, will present uh, more in depth examples, you will see that by crossing data from many different um, heterogeneous data sources, you can improve its quality. You can flag inconsistencies. You can uh, learn things that you could not learn if you look if you did not look at data in its totality. You can infer new facts. You can do all sorts of cool things. Um, and on top of that, if you want to do any kind of data mining, you have to first integrate the data. So um, a lot of people um, do data mining these days. Um, Actually, data mining is, is, is kind of, and, and deep learning are kind of equated these days with artificial intelligence. Um, these are extremely success, successful and useful techniques um, with the caveat that they're all um, bottom up. So you look at a lot of data and you try to learn things about it, patterns, okay? There's another type of approach, which is top down rather than bottom up, which has to do more with uh, defining the semantic of, of, of things, things that have to do more with common sense, with things that you cannot learn with um, causality relationships and, and things that you cannot learn by just looking at, at the data and not having any more, um, any additional information, okay? So, um, there's more than data mining, but even only for data mining, people just assume, oh, give me the data set and I'll do the cool things and I'll, 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 I'll learn patterns. Well, okay, uh, <laughs> take it. You have, I don't know, 20 data sets, each of them with different in different places, in different formats. So somebody has to um, integrate it and clean it for you. And a lot of people assume that this work is already done and it's not done and it's it's, part of uh, the very difficult uh, job that you have to do in, in uh, data mining, uh, sorry, data, big data integration, okay? So these are some examples, very high level of projects in our group, so that you, you see a little bit the, the extent of, of the type of things that we're looking at in, in terms of interdisciplinary. So um, these are two projects that are, one has finished last year, uh, uh, Grow Smarter, which is a Lighthouse European project, age 2020, Secutil is finishing now. It's a um, um, local project, Feder Ristraskat, for those of you that know what that is. Um, they are basically projects that look into the sustainability and resilience of smart cities. And most of the data that they integrate have to do with, uh, are, are in form of numerical data in structure form, but in many places. Okay. Linda Fix is a project that will also finish soon, is uh, 
uh, Resarkasha project. And um, it is concerned with trying to help the uh, social services um, departments in cities and social, social science workers with, um, well, helping them help other people, uh, helping them assess the necessities of people that ask for help in these departments, um, ranking who needs more help in, an, in which categories, in what type of um, um, aid, and also trying to learn patterns so that um, they can predict a little bit who may be in danger of uh, social exclusion and poverty okay, by looking at patterns. Uh, St. George on a Bike, it's our um, European project that has to do with cultural heritage and it's concerned with generating uh, rich metadata for paintings. This is what we're gonna, you are going to see for the rest of the talk after I'm done with my introduction. Okay. Um, and lastly, I want to mention a um, an app that we, we toyed with and it's it's well, it's pretty cool. It's small, but it's pretty cool. And it has to do with uh, detecting hotspots for uh, COVID. And it's based on integrating um, geolocalized data from, from phones and uh, text. You'll see what it is about. It's, it, it doesn't, uh, it obviously it requires um, the users to, to willingly participate so that they can give this data to us. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to repeat this. Um, you all know about the many Vs of big data, four Vs, five Vs, seven Vs, whatever, I don't know how many they have now. Um, volume and velocity, uh, which are the first two, are not really a, um, 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 what is it called, a showstopper, right? So, well, if you have to deliver results in real time, then that's a lot more difficult, but um, usually velocity doesn't have to do with how fast you produce an answer, it has to do with how much, how, how fast data comes at you. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk a bit about is veracity and variety, just to touch on them, to say that these are the two, let's say more difficult Gs these days. Um, Veracity has to do with many different directions, many different aspects of data quality, let's say, if we can call it like that. It has to do with how truthful the, da the, the data, the information is, whether it was obtained objectively or subjectively, um, uh, how credible this data is, the source of this data is, how accurate, how complete, is it consistent when I put it together with other data? Things. So th there's many aspects to veracity. Okay. And um, in order to, to, to deal with veracity, you have to, uh, well, take into account that there's biases and abnormality in the data. And there's also noise. And sometimes, as you can see here in the, ooh, sorry, in the last example at the bottom of this slide, sometimes the noise is actually not um, a bug, <laughs> it's a feature, okay? So sometimes you want to produce, to only record um, noisy data. Uh, for example, in the case of location information, okay? Because you want to ensure privacy. So you have to deal with all these things. And on top of that, you have to deal with, um, as you will see in St. George on a Bike, in, in our um, cultural heritage project, you have to deal with the lack of metadata. So sometimes you, you search or you want to do analyses on top of data, but you need to know what that stuff is about, okay? Because sometimes it's, um, it's in raw form and um, it would be much better if you actually had some metadata associated to it so that you know what it is about, okay? So um, that is another aspect that is going to be very present in the rest of the presentation. And variety has to do with, uh, well, it was perceived up until a couple of years ago. I'm not sure what is perceived now, the biggest V, but um, about 70% of, of uh, top uh, US scientists in over a hundred institutions and, excuse me, and, um, and uh, companies consider that variety is the biggest problem. What is variety? 
many data sources um, of very heterogeneous types. Okay, sensor, text, picture, whatever, transactions, geospatial, all sorts of stuff. Okay? Uh, in structure, semi-structured, and sometimes unstructured form. Okay? How do people deal with this um, heterogeneity usually? Well, um, by applying ETLs, extract, transform, and load um, methodology. So you basically validate the data, um, you extract it from whatever format you have it, and you transform it into a common format. Um, and in the process of transforming it, you cleanse it. Okay, so you cleanse um, uh, by relying on the data that you have already validated in the extract step. And then you write it to a data, to, to a, usually to a warehouse. Okay, what are the problems with this? Well, you move the data around, okay? You transform it and you move it around. Um, so if you need to not move the data around or you don't have the rights to move it around or whatever, then um, this technology does not apply well. Uh, the databases are generally the bottleneck when you do this transform operations. And uh, possibly more importantly, uh, well, or equally important is that if you want to do ad hoc data exploration, um, relational databases, which are, which are basically the output of ETL uh, type methodologies are, are not um, good for that. They're good for um, dense transactional data, but they're not good for sparse data, for spatial data, for temporal data. Okay? So there are some inconvenience um, when using ETL. What can you do instead of ETL? Link data and semantic technologies. What does it mean? You leave the data where it is. You basically build a model okay, of your domain or domains that you want to model. You leave the data where it is. You connect the data through this model. You query the data through this model. So if the data changes or the structure, or data could be dynamic or sparse or whatever, um, only the connections of the data itself to the model change, but the model stays unchanged you uh, much more easily can use um, this model in different places, for example, in different cities, um, because what you're building is a model of a domain, not a model for a specific application. Okay. And um, as you, as I was mentioning a little bit, and um, I will mention in one more slide, you can do, you can make, um, um, reasoning you can make inter uh, inferences okay you can reason about the information that it's explicitly defined to infer information um, that is not explicitly defined okay and this way you improve um, things like metadata you observe inconsistencies you, you do all sorts of uh, nice stuff that helps you with um, data quality okay so uh what does it mean when I'm saying semantic model? Basically an ontology, and this is the only slide I'm talking about ontology, just so that you know what it is. An ontology is basically, you can imagine in, in the simplest form is a graph uh, where you have classes as nodes, relationships as edges, and then you, on top of that, you also have constraints, okay? Between uh, classes and relations. If classes or classes and relations. Um, you have instances, which is the actual data that is uh, connected, um, that, that are integrated via uh, the ontology. And then you have this inference rules, okay? I'm not saying, and this is very important, that ontologies should replace databases. They are complementary. They refer to different, um, well, they, they, they address different concerns, let's say, and they're good at different things. So they're complementary, okay? So let me just go back to the examples that, to the um, projects that I was mentioning. So in Grow Smarter, for example, by using a semantic model on ontology, we can do all sorts of stuff like integrating the data about um, mobility, integrated infrastructures, energy, pollution, urban structures, so many different verticals. Okay? We can compute indicators uh, that are they, that's in this case are also modeled as part of the ontology and you can do query and visualization. So this is just an example of a query that it's very hard, well, very hard not to say impossible to um, formulate if you have, um, if you have the, 
the, the different um, heterogeneous sources not integrated or data from different verticals that are not integrated. Okay, so what is basically this says, uh, give me how much solar energy a building is using out of the solar energy that that building is producing itself. Okay, well, it's a bit more compl complex here because it also defines an area, but okay. This graphic, uh, excuse me, graph on the right expresses exactly this, okay. It looks complex because, well, it actually is a complex um, query. In English, it sounds easy, but when you actually define what kind of energy, um, what kind of um, measurement at your look, are you looking at, um, whether the solar, anyway, so there's all sorts of details that you have to, um, that are left a little bit ambiguous in English, that in a formal model you have to, and in, in a database you would, you would have to do that as well, except that you would formulate different queries separately in probably SQL, and then you would have to uh, manually combine the results. Okay, this way you have, you define, well, maybe it's more complex, but you define this query and it stays unchanged as long as the model stays unchanged, although the data can change. How does this help me? Well, uh, it helps me as um, me as a city authority because I can run all types of scenarios. I can have a global view of the city. I can compute indicators. I can do all sorts of stuff. Second example, Linda Fix. This was the, the project that I mentioned about uh, social exclusions and poverty. I'm not gonna go into, into examples here, but let's assume that you want to compute um, indicators of inequality between uh, people in a city or between cities. And this could be one indicator or an input for a more complex KPI indicator. Okay? Uh, does a person have adequate lodging? Well, I'm not gonna go in detail through this, but basically how I define that it has adequate lodging. Well, it has to have heating, it has to have hot water, and it has two more um, conditions. One of them is that the minimum area of the uh, apartment is, is at, least, at least as big as, well, some number, um, 25 square meters in this case and that uh, the minimum square meter area of the of the lodging is also um, at least 10 plus the number of inhabitants multiplied by 10. Anyway, this is um, an indicator that that um, the social departments use in evaluating people uh, manually. Okay. How does it help? Well, it helps, as I said, with assessment and it helps, hopefully, excuse me, it helps um, understanding which are the, the critical areas for a person and what are the patterns and, and try to prevent a little bit things from happening in the future. Another project, Secutil, this focuses on modeling city resilience uh, to understand things like uh, complex cascaded effects between when, so let's assume that a hazard happens, some, something bad happens in a city, either a natural hazard or man-made hazard, okay? And we would like to understand uh, who do we need to contact, what place, what plans are in place to recover from, from that hazard and things like that. So on the right here, again, you see um, uh, a query um that represents this like when a hazard occurs this hazard here you can replace it with flooding or whatever um what networks are affected who are the maintainers of these networks and what contingency plans are in, pla in place for reconfiguration okay so by having the model it's much more much easier to to understand the cascaded effects i don't see my watch so i don't know how much more i have i'll try to go quickly um, um, right, and you can also, in, in this case, I'm not going to go into details, but you can also um, deduce new relationships in this, um, let's say, resilience model and, and understand connections that are not specifically explicitly defined. 
this is the um, the little app for um, detecting hotspots. So imagine that you've been diagnosed with COVID and you're willing to share your information, your geolocalized information from your cell phone, and you're willing to fill in um, like a short questionnaire about what you've done. This is just an example. What you've done 12 hours before you were confined or hospitalized or detected that you have COVID, okay? And let's assume that you write this thing. I spent all morning because I had a at home and after lunch, I went to the dentist and I picked up my kids at the nursery, okay? Um, as you probably all know, your phone, your cell phone does not record all the, like the continuous um, um, trajectory that you're, that you're uh, following in a city, okay? They're, they're blind spots. So the idea is by combining um, these um, geolocalized information, here you have, for example, a blip, you don't have data, there are some smaller blips around here, but by knowing that, by, by reading the text that this person has filled in and it, it talks about the dentist and, and the nursery, uh, it would try to uh, find what are the closest geo-referenced nurseries and dentists to disrupt, okay? Um, and finally, I'm going to uh, finish in a couple of introductory slides about the rest of the talk, which is about cultural heritage. Um, actually, let me go here first. Well, no, I'm just going to go here. So what is the idea? The idea is that we wanted to provide metadata, good metadata for paintings, for cultural heritage images, and we're focusing on, on paintings in between the 12th and the 18th century in Europe. Um, and um, we started by, well, we, we want to generate good metadata in terms of what objects are present <clears throat> and in the painting, and also try to generate good captions for what happens in that picture. Because usually you have the title, but the title may not be significant. So in, in a significant, it, it may not tell you what actually happens in the painting, okay? So um, if you use, there's some, there's some tools out there that are built over um, a very large, uh, very large databases of aligned pictures and captions, but these are pictures, okay? So the captions are, are, are things that people annotated manually, okay? And the pictures are, well, pictures. They're not pictures of paintings. They're pictures of everyday life, our life, 21st, maybe 20th century life. Okay. When you use these tools, you get this kind of uh, captions here. I don't know if you can read this. A dog is laying on the ground with a dog. A couple of people riding on a motorcycle. A couple of cats laying on top of a rock. Okay, and these are all St. George killing the dragon. Okay, so um, we would like to do a little bit better than this, a lot better than this. So what is our project about? Is about trying to understand the context, the temporal context and um, uh, at some point go beyond that to, to more symbolic things um, and, and make it in such a way that, that the, the AI tools that we're developing understand this kind of context and generate things that are appropriate for that context, okay? So this is our, our, our main challenge. As I said, we're looking at European 12th to 18th century uh, paintings and we are focusing for now on uh, it's a more reduced, but very interesting, more interesting, I would say, um, let's say subset of paintings. We're looking at sacred art for now, okay? What kind of techniques are we using to do all I said that we wanted to do, good metadata? We're using deep learning, we're using language models, um, and we're using uh, semantic information to do all sorts of inferencing and um, hopefully do a good job. So um, two examples of data integration that help us in this project. One of them is aligning images and texts for caption generation. And the other one is including, uh, let's say, um, taking into account uh, common sense knowledge, for example, a language model, in which you would have, if you start from man and armor to labels, the language model would generate knight, okay? Uh, knights, well, um, 
um, Kim is going to explain this. I'm not going to go into any detail, but this, this is a very high level idea. And the other idea, uh, try to use top down semantic model to do other kind of inferencing in, from which, for example, you may, gen, may be able to generate visual relations. Like, for example, you may have some rules that say, oh, a dog protects the all the family of its owner. Okay, a man, a specific man, for example, a man owns a dog and the, this man is married to some woman. Okay, then it results by inferencing, logic inferencing, that the dog protects the woman. Anyway, this is very abstract that we're looking at this kind of things. Okay. Um, so for the rest of the talk, well, I'm uh, Artem is going to talk next. I hope Artem is connected. Um, he's going to talk about um, the more generic problem of object detection and then um, improving object labels by placing them in context. And then Kim um, is going to talk about how to use the language model to generate more precise labels. And basically, you are going to start from a set of labels for the bounding boxes in which you have things that are definitely cannot be true for a painting of St. George. You have teddy bears, bikes, and baseball bats, okay? And you want to get to something where instead of teddy bears, you get princesses. Instead of bikes, um, you have horses. Instead of baseball bats, you have lances or swords. A dog is replaced by a dragon and the person is refined to be a knight. And if we can, that would be awesome. Uh, St. George. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I'll give the floor to Artem. And if you have any questions, I, I guess at the end is better. Thank you. So, um, can you hear me properly? Yes. Oh, cool. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Let me share my screen. So uh, basically, yes, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, first step of the project of St. George on a bike about, uh, I will talk about the object detection and about deep learning approach. Uh, as far as you remember, we have uh, the specific session uh, about artificial intelligence on Friday. Um, um, so they will, uh, the guys will explain uh, more about deep learning and about object detection, but we will, <clears throat> but I will talk about the object detection in case of uh, cultural heritage. Um, so as Maria Cristina said, uh, the main idea of this project is to generate some meta information about the, of the, about the, about the painting. Um, the, the first idea which we had um, just to apply the state of art uh, object detection model and uh, see the results, uh, what kind of objects uh, will, uh, will be will be detected. Um, but at the same time, we understood uh, that these types of the models um, can be an issue or can be uh, the challenge because almost all of them were trained uh, on the everyday images. And uh, this approach fail for cultural heritage. Um, second, Second problem, second issue is variety of styles. So, for example, like if we are talking about the paintings of Renaissance, they are pretty uh, realistic. But at the same time, the um, the impressionism paintings of 18th century, they have a specific style which we had uh, have which we have to take into account in our models. Uh, the next issue is uh, imaginary beings. For example, like how we can detect the angels or dragons or devils or witches, uh, which not exist in real world. And basically because of this, um, the, the state of the art models cannot detect them because there are, there are, there, there is, uh, the, there are no any photo of the witch or dragon. Um, we have to understand uh, the symbols on the paintings, because it's uh, really important uh, in case of understanding of the iconography of the of the painting. Uh, any any object on the paintings can be a symbol which uh, can be related with uh, another object. And uh, this is like chain of uh, relationships can give us understanding of about what's going on in the painting. And we have uh, to take into account the time. 
as Maria Cristina said, for example, the baseball or the teddy bear cannot appear on the paintings of uh, 15th or 16th century. So basically, because of these um, main problems, we decided uh, to improve uh, the state of the art models and we choose uh, two main ways. Uh, first way is integrating the additional metadata into the model, into the object detection model. And this additional metadata can be can have different types, uh, can be different types. Um, it can be description, it can be name of the author, it can be uh, the name of the paintings, it can be, I don't know, style or something like that. But first of all, we decided to think about the type because it's the most interesting part for us and we decided to try to integrate the time into the model and the model uh, during the process of object detection will take into account the time. How we can, uh, how we could do it. So today we talked, uh, I guess it was previous session uh, about no SQL uh, databases. We talked about the knowledge graphs. Uh, so the knowledge graphs, basically the, the technology which used to store the complex structure and unstructured information. And there are uh, several different uh, knowledge graphs where we can extract some uh, information about the objects uh, when, we, when, we can, when we can detect the relationships between this information, between the, the graphs of the, uh, between the graphs. And we can use this information uh, in, in, in our model. So here you can see several examples of uh, different knowledge graphs. Uh, and I guess uh, Wikipedia is one of them as well. Um, so the, the, the idea how we decided to integrate uh, the time into the model um, we presented in this scheme. For example, uh, we decided, for example, we used uh, the state of the R model. The model detected the person, the model, the model detected the, the head, to so head and uh, the model detected the book. Um, sending this information into the knowledge graph, we can, we can, we can understand that the Tsuheto is a small uh, hut or school cup, which was by the clerics or popes in, in, in various Catholic churches. Um, we can, for example, extract the information about the book. So it's, it's something like for recording the information. By uh, processing this additional information, we can assume that the person on the image on the, in the paintings is a pope or cardinal with a book. Um, but at the same time, we understood that uh, this approach is really nice in case of like uh, adding, in case of receiving more additional metadata. But this approach cannot help us to improve the accuracy of the, uh, of the object detection model. So for example, if the model will detect the the baseball bat or teddy bear, what we can do with it. Um, we decided uh, to use uh, the, the approach which calls refining the classes. For example, um, you can see the three uh, different uh, sources of information. So Google Ngram Viewer uh, is, um, is a Google API which shows the appearance of the word in in time contacts for example if you will uh, put the the word car uh, it will show us that normally cars appears just in 18th century so wikidata is like similar to wikipedia it's knowledge graph about the objects and you can find di different additional information about any type of the objects and dictionary approach it's uh, it's a simplest approach where we can uh, just detect um, the first known use of the word so according to the dictionary approach, for example, the word car, I mean, I'm talking about the English language right now, uh, appears in uh, 14th century. Um, these three um, sources of information were um, the main one for extracting uh, the time, uh, the time context, the time information for the objects. 
I will explain later what is it because it's a bit like difficult right now. So this example about the car from Google and Gram Viewer. So you can see that the main uh, use of the of the word was in uh, 20th century, but at the same time there was uh, using of uh, this word in 16th century as well. So basically, how we can uh, integrate this information, this time information into the model, into, into the state of the art model uh, of object detection. We created the time matrix. So the, the simplest representation of the time matrix you can see right now on your screens. So it's, it's just a table where we have the column of items and the column of centuries. So in the rows, we have the all objects uh, of the of the model and uh, the century when he, it was appeared. So we used uh, the dictionary approach. So we used uh, the first known use of the of the word. Um, as you can see, the chair, uh, the word chair, started to use in uh, 13th century, the beer in 12th century, the bus in 19th century, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the, um, the scheme of integrating uh, this information into the model. So let's assume that our model detected the bicycle, person, dining table, cell phone, and book, as you can see on the, uh, on the left. Uh, by processing this information using the knowledge graph, for example, Wikidata or dictionary approach, we can assume that uh, the person, the, the word person, appeared in 13th century. The word bicycle appeared in 18th century, and so on, and it's so and so. But taking into account that the painting uh, appeared in uh, 17th century, we can delete some kind of classes. And based on this information, we can improve the precision of the, the model. On the left side, you can see the examples after the processing. So we deleted the bicycle, we deleted the cell phone, we deleted the ten, the, the linear table. And right now, uh, we can assume that, yes, uh, the object detection model works better because the, the precision is better. But at the same time, we understood that we are losing some kind of information. So if the model detected uh, this information, these objects, uh, it means that there is something there and we can we have to understand what it was. Uh, based on this on this idea, we decided uh, not deleting the classes but refining the classes. Um, this is another example. So uh, on the left side, you can see the cell phone. You can see several persons, and uh, using the the same approach, uh, we understood that the person appeared in century in thirteenth century, and the cell phone appeared in twentieth century. Uh, but how we can refine these classes? So basically, we decided to extract the probability, because normally deep learning models um, generate the list of probabilities for each uh, detected objects. Um, this list of probabilities means that uh, for for one area, for one object, um, the model generates the probability for each class. For example, if uh, in a model we have like uh, 20 classes, we will, for each area of interest, for each object, we will receive the list of uh, 20 probabilities. And we can assume that, okay, the highest probability is cell phone, but what is the next? Uh, in this uh, list of probabilities, we will see that the, the next highest uh, probability is, uh, is a book. And by comparing this information with time context, we can understand that it's not cell phone, it's a book. By refining these types of uh, classes, we can uh, increase the precision. Uh, we can increase the precision of the, uh, of the model. And based on this information, we can, uh, based on this type of the model, we can, for example, generate the tags or generate some meta information for the the, for the for the images for the paintings which we have, um, this approach is really interesting in case of like refining the classes. But this approach uh, is not solving one of uh, the biggest issue of this project. Uh, what we can do is uh, 
angels, uh, dragons, witchers, and all of these imagery beings. This approach uh, is not solving the problem of a variety of the styles. So that's why we decided to create uh, our own data set and train our own model for object detection. Uh, ah, no. Yeah. So this is just one more example of uh, refining the classes. Uh, as you can see, the, the model uh, on the left side detected the fire hydrant and uh, the tie. And after refining the classes, we received the person and background. So basically, we understood that there is uh, nothing there. This is one more example. The main uh, area of interest is uh, laptop and uh, and back and teddy bear. Um, on the left side, we uh, on the right side, we can see the book. We can see the background and. Um, Instead of teddy bear, we use the bird, but it's like, it's it's a mistake as well. Uh, yeah, and this is one more example with handbag, and on the left, on the right side, we can see the it was detected as a background without any object there. Um, coming back uh, to object detection, we decided to create our own data set uh, for training our own model. And we already have some, some kind of results. So basically data set um, consists um, in information data from different sources, um, from European collection, from icon class test set, from Wikimedia, Wikiart, uh, and um, collections of several museums. Um, I mean, if you're in, interested in cultural heritage, you know these uh, data sources. If not, you can check. Uh, it's pretty interesting to, to see these, these types of collections. But the point that um, this is sources of raw data. So the data is not labeled. Uh, it's not well structured. Uh, it's not, uh, there is no any kind of uh, meta information and we did it manually from, from the scratch. Basically, right now we have like um, 69 classes. Uh, the data set contains uh, 5K images, um, and there is some technical information about the data set and the architecture of the, uh, of the, of the model, which we used for budget detection. And here you can see the results. So basically, right now, our model can detect uh, already angels, person, and all of this stuff. And you can see the comparison of uh, state-of-the-art models and our model. Um, here you can see some, some more examples. Um, so as you can see, the model can detect the crowns, palms, uh, toheto, halo, book, uh, some, some, kind, some, some, type, some types of uh, heads for uh, popes, uh, boats, banners, and all of this stuff. And here, um, the list of classes, um, um, which we can detect right now, but it's not the final one because right now we are like uh, in the process of uh, refining the list of classes and it will increase uh, in the future. And basically the data set, uh, the number of uh, instances, the number of images and the number of classes will increase in the future as well. Um, right now, it's not available and it's not uh, published yet, but we will do it as soon as possible. Um, that's all. I'm glad to answer your questions. As Maria Christina said, it's better at the end of the session, but feel free to write it in the chat and as soon as uh, possible, I will answer. And I guess, Kim, it's your turn. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me let me share the screen. Can you see now the data contextualization? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, well. So. Uh, good afternoon. I am uh, Joaquim Moret, Kim Moret. I'm a computational linguist at uh, 
the case department at BSC. And my talk is, uh, is uh, how to use a resource in order to um, get refined classes and uh, these links to what uh, um, Artem and Maria Cristina said before. So the idea is that, well, uh, Maria Cristina show you some examples of uh, state of the art, state of the art results. And they were quite uh, funny. But uh, if, if, if we imagine that there is a system that works quite well, the most uh, it can describe by now is in a painting like this of St. George killing a dragon, is a person on a horse. Uh, so this is the best we can expect from a, a current uh, image uh, um, description. Why? Because the, um, the system is not trained with dragons, with uh, knights, <laughs> with lances and all this. And uh, the, the, the system is uh, strained by uh, detecting people or persons. So the class is a generic, is a generic class. So in that case, it says a person. But of course, when we are looking at a picture like this, to say a person on a horse, it's not enough. We should or should expect that it's a knight, it's a rider, or if we want to, if we want the system to be very specific, to say that it's Saint George. But a person is not; it seems not enough. So, <clears throat> how can we overcome this limitation? Of course, the one solution is to collect. Uh, paintings and paintings and, or, or images of paintings of uh, St. George killing dragons and uh, to annotate these paintings saying it's St. George killing a dragon. And of course, uh, this should be done uh, manually. But of course, this task is very tedious and, and as you know, as we use a uh, 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 an image description by using machine uh, learning and specifically deep learning, we need lots and lots and lots and lots of examples to train the, the system. So the task of, um, of manually um, tagging the, 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 the collection of paintings is quite uh, tedious and, and it's not, uh, it, it, it's even not uh, feasible. The other limitation is one that uh, it was uh, said before, that the current systems are trained with present day images. So because of this, in this painting, a person on a horse, uh, the most, uh, or most of the systems say that it's a man on a motor uh, on a bike so the the horse is mistaken as a bike because most of the Im images or the the pictures the system is trained with are uh, people on bikes not on horses and specifically men instead of women there are more example of men uh, riding bikes than women riding bikes so is one of the limitations of uh, training with present day images. So the idea is how can we uh, overcome this problem? One, on the one hand, we have that the manual tagging is quite, uh, it's not feasible, that the images are, are present day images. So, one solution is, well, let's collect paintings with a symbolic or a past 
meaning. But of course, uh, it's not such easy, so easy because uh, the collections of uh, the museum collections have copyright rights, and uh, they are not, not very easy to collect. It's not they are not easy to collect. But uh, imagine that we had all the all the pictures from all the museums, examples of uh, the dragons and St. George and, and this are not enough to train the, the system. There are not enough examples to train the system. So the idea is, well, how to overcome this problem with the sparsity of the data, but we don't have enough paintings to train the system. So the idea is, well, so if we don't have uh, the paintings, as the paintings describe something which is a cultural frame, why not use the language as a frame of our cultural heritage, as a frame of our ideas, as a frame of our symbolic relations? So we guessed, we guessed uh, this, that why not perform what is the what is said a close test to uh, overcome the data sparsity? What is the close test? Well, the close test is very similar to the filling in the blanks test when you learn a second language. That you have a context and then there is a blank, and you have to fill in the blank according to the context. So. The, 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 the thing is, why don't we infer a class or a, a, an object by using this kind of test? For instance, if we have a person wearing a crown, is either a king or a queen or a monarch. Or a, par a person riding a horse is most probably a rider. So instead of training the, the, the system with images of kings and queens are riders, why don't we use the language as a, a predictor of these classes? So, how can we uh, implement this uh, closed test computationally? So the idea is to use a transformer-based language model that attempts to predict the original value of a mass word based on the context provided by the other non mass words in the sequence. Well, this is the, the literal um, definition of what a transformer-based language model is. The transformer-based language model uh, now are very, are on, well, are very popular. So for instance, BERT and other kind of language models. And the, the language models, the transformer language models, have two characteristics. One of, one of these is that the language model is evaluated by performing a closed test. So if the language model is able to predict uh, a word uh, according to the context or from the context, this is a good model. So we can use this task in order to infer the the objects that uh, we want to we want to predict, and on the other on the other hand, transformer-based language models are good to perform what is called transfer learning. That is, the the model learned with thousands and thousands and thousands of documents and millions of documents, which is a very Big, da big data task is transferred to be performed for a specific uh, task. In that case, the specific task is to detect uh, um, an entity. So it's an example of transfer learning. The um, language model learned, the general language model learned is transferred to uh, be used in a specific uh, uh, task like uh, ours. So we have talked about uh, context of sequences. 
and we distinguish two uh, kinds of uh, sequences. The first one is the visual relation sequence, which is a, a person wearing a crown. So in a visual relation sequence, there is an entity and another entity, and there is a relation word in between. In that case, the relation word is wearing. So something wears something. And when we get this visual relation sequence, then it, this can be uh, embedded in the reference sequ sequence, the class inferred. So a person wearing a crown is a monarch. So this is an example. Imagine that in the painting, we uh, have, we identify a person and a crown. And these are the bounding boxes that, that delimit the, these entities. And these uh, entities are uh, put in a visual relation sequence. So person and crown. So the, the, the thing is, first we have to infer the visual, rela uh, the visual relation word that links these two entities. In that case, is a person wearing a crown. And then when we have this visual relation sequence, this is in, embedded in the reference sequence. So a person wearing a crown is a monarch, king, and queen. Well, this is what this is intuition, but now we will see how this can be implemented. In that case, we use um, the, the language model. We use a, a BERT language model that we can, you can get from the, the Transformers um, collection of, of models. And then we load this language model. And then we perform the kind, this kind of uh, filling in the blanks exercise, and we see a person wearing a crown is a, and then according to the language model, uh, we can t we can have um, predicted um, entities. The first one is a person wearing a crown is a crown. Well, <laughs> it's not, it's not quite good. A person wearing a crown is a monarch, a person wearing a crown is a king, a person wearing a crown is a sovereign, a person wearing a crown is a queen. So, uh, only the first one is not, is, is not, uh, that does not fit what we expect. So, there is a constraint, which is that the inferred um, entity must be semantically related to the, the entity uh, in the um, visual relation relationship. So the, the entity um, inferred should be a person. So in between person and monarch should be uh, a semantic relationship called uh, hypernym. So according to this constraint, so all these uh, uh, options could be right. So we take the we take the first one and we have we have the score and so we we could take the the one with the highest score. So let's see how can we generate the visual relation sequences. So in that case, the visual uh, as you is I, I told you that in order to get the visual relation uh, context, we have to infer the uh, visual relation between the entity one and entity two. Entity one here is person and entity two is here is horse. And according to the model, uh, we have the first one is a dot. So we don't admit uh, uh, punctuation marks. But the second one is on, so a person on a horse or a person riding a horse or a person with a horse or even a person and a horse. And you know, for the case of a, per, uh, of a person wings, we have a person with wings as the first option, or a person without wings. So in that case, we can infer the relation word between these two entities. So when we have the, the, um, the visual relation context, 
we can bear it. So we can infer. So if the, take the, the, let's take the first option, the first the visual relation option, which was a person on a horse. So a person on a horse is a. Of course, we have a person on a horse is a horse. <laughs> this is quite obvious, but according to the constraint I told you before, we take uh, as options. Um, mm, words that have a semantic relation uh, to uh, person. So the, the good options could be person, rider, rider, human, man. Of course, person is not taken because we don't want to be the, the, the inferred class should not be the same as the, the context uh, relation class. So we take a uh, rider. So, a uh, similar example we, we, we could have a person with wings is a <coughs> first option is a bird, no, fly, <laughs> uh, no, butterfly, pigeon, person, no, no, but, uh, they cannot, they, they are not acceptable. And why? And th there's this, the, the reason is something that we should, in a way, uh, to uh, meant, which is we have to put this in the right context. So if we put a person with wings is an, then we have angel as a first option. This is a thing that uh, it should be uh, corrected or mended from the language model. So we are looking for language models that they are not uh, they are not sensitive. To, to this kind of to this kind of context. So uh, so let's see. So in that case, first we had person and person, and as a person with wings is an angel, if it detects the person, and if it detects the wings, so person with wings is an angel. Then we have an angel in that case. So well, let's see an, an example. So let's imagine that in the in the picture we have four uh, bounding boxes, which is our uh, four entities identified, with, with which are person, horse, sword, and dragon. So <clears throat> we said that according to the language model, person and horse, person on a horse was a rider. So person or horse can be uh, replaced with rider. So we have now the relationship between rider and sword and rider and dragon. So <clears throat> what, um, what uh, re um, visual relationships between, between rider and sword can be? So a rider with a sword, a rider holding a sword, a rider carrying a sword, etc., etc. So in that case, a rider with a sword, maybe you cannot see it, maybe, but you have a rider with a sword is a horse, of not, of course not. A rider with a sword is a rider. A rider is the same as rider in the in the previous context, and uh, I promise you that uh, below <laughs> it says that a rider with a sword is a knight. So I see that it, that doesn't appear. So in that case. Uh, the painting uh, should be, uh, although the, the caption of the painting should be a knight fight, fighting a dragon. Hmm? Be why? Why this? Oh, sorry. Why this? Because when we have knight, between knight and dragon, the visual relationship is fighting. So in that case, for this reason, we have this caption, a knight fighting a dragon. And if we continue um, performing this, and if we have that a knight fighting a dragon is a, notice that one of the options could be a knight fighting a dragon is a hero. So the thing is that not all the knights fighting dragons are St. George. They can be other, 
other people. For instance, uh, the case of Siegfried, that is a hero fighting a dragon. And this uh, opens an interesting path, which is that for uh, when we create meta metadata, um, we can uh, have mm, information that which is not very obvious and we and show it as a way of saying, well, uh, other oral related items, oral related topics. So for a, um, for a, a user that browses a, a museum collection or a collection like Europeana, and he looks for or searches for um, people fighting dragons, of course, he will find uh, St. George uh, fighting a dragon, but also uh, Siegfried, Beowulf, Frodo, uh, and uh, King Arthur. So other uh, people that uh, were not on their minds. So it's a way of, uh, of getting a deeper information uh, in, a, in a search. So, well, so I think that's all <laughs> from my part. So if you have any question. The hour doesn't help, and the fact that it's online doesn't help, but uh, please ask. <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, well, There are questions in the chat. Yes. Okay. But but I see that Artem has answered it. <laughs> or maybe I don't I don't see all of them. Well, maybe I Artem can explain a little bit the transfer learning if you want to, or you. Can... No, no, I, I, I answered for the questions which were related to my part of the session, and um, there is also the question about the slides. Uh, can we share the slides and how we can? I guess uh, we will send it to, to the organizers, and then then they will share the slides with with participants. Is any of you doing research in like looking at at raw data like images and videos? If you don't ask me, I'll ask you. <laughs> okay, I take it as a no. Thanks, Carlos. I have a question. 
Uh, yes. Can, Would you mind speaking can, up a little bit? Can you hear me? Uh, kind of. <laughs> yes, Carlos. Yes. Okay. So recently, uh, some uh, models uh, have been able to describe very precisely uh, what are what is in a in a picture, and, and even to the, to generate the actual images and the pictures from the description that is the other way around what you were trying to do have you um, look into that and see uh, if from the if you can bootstrap from that uh, kind of processing i think this is the adversarial network yes, question i don't know artem if you can answer that i don't know Basically, um, yes and no at the same time. So the main idea of the um, of this type of the networks is uh, combining the um, the the convolutional neural networks and um, NLP approaches. So and when these two types of the neural networks uh, make kind of attention between the elements of the text and elements of the images. So for training these types of neural networks, we have uh, we need uh, the data again. So at least we need the, a lot of data of images where we can uh, find the, uh, the specific objects and we need good descriptions for these images. So the description should be like uh, built properly, like um, the, 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 there is a horse with, uh, with a man and uh, there is a woman in front of the somewhere, I don't know. And basically that the problem, that the main problem right now. So we don't have uh, the data, uh, we don't have the data set with these types of the descriptions, with good descriptions, because all of the sources where we try to find the data, uh, the descriptions are really bad. And basically uh, they are not about the painting, they are about the history of the painting, they are about the uh, history of the place where the painting uh, was created or uh, about the life story of the author. So the, the idea of um, generating of images by the descriptions is really interesting. But in our case, in case of cultural heritage, I guess on this level, it's, it's a bit difficult. It's a bit tricky subject. Uh, Artem, if you if you allow me, um, because because of the the, the difficulty uh, of having good descriptions for for paintings, um, because uh, well the current uh, systems are trained with short sentences that uh, describe a straight uh, straightly what is uh, in in the painting. Uh, if you take the descriptions from painting uh, of paintings from Museo del Prado and another, as Artem said, there are references to the author and all in the same paragraph. So there is a lot of noise. So one of the things we are we are working now is how to extract from long texts and long paragraphs the sentences that refer to the content of the painting, in order to get. Uh, good uh, sentences to train the system. Because if we take the description as they are, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the noise is very significant. So for this reason, we, uh, we are performing a classifier that identifies the sentences from the, these long descriptions, the sentences that refer to the content. And according to this, we have uh, data to train to train the model. So it's it's, it's one of the good one it, one of the hard work. It's, it's hard work for us to perform. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I just um, we're um, we're also starting to work on something that has to do with the uh, relative position of bounding boxes to and that may that would make it easier to know whether a person is you know person line of sight like is looking left right up down so this would be also rich information 
um, the our colleague who's working on this part right now is is not in in the call. Um, Cedric B. 